today we are going to start a new topic that is called adsorption. Adsorption is used in the early stages of uh, downstream processing. Adsorption can be used for uh, recovery of uh, desired products or sometimes uh, it can also be used to remove some unwanted products. Adsorption is a surface uh, phenomena. Suppose there are impurities present in your broth which may hinder your from uh, remaining downstream, then we may resort to adsorption to remove that uh, particular uh, unwanted product. Sometimes if you are interested in a protein in a very large fermentation broth, so we may resort to adsorption to slightly concentrate the protein onto the surface of an adsorbent. So, basically adsorption consists of uh, a surface uh, phenomena where the molecules of interest or the species of interest gets accumulated when you compare it with the concentration in the bulk, the concentration at the surface will be much higher. This happens because of uh, several forces. Um, generally, we may have non-bonded interactions like Van der Waal forces, electrostatic forces, ionic forces and so on, um, because you generally do not go for a uh, irreversible adsorption, then uh, the adsorbent gets totally spoilt and you will not be able to regenerate it. So, the generally the adsorption is a reversible adsorption process. So, it is a surface phenomena and it arises because of the unbalanced or residual forces that are present at the interface. For example, interface between a solid and a liquid or a gas and a liquid and so on actually. So, that is the place where the adsorption takes place. So, the molecules or the species get attracted to the surface of uh, a, a say for example, a carbon particle or a zeolite particle um, and so on. So, the species get attracted to this adsorbent and they remain on the surface. You also must have heard about absorption that is A B whereas adsorption is uh, using ad so both are different the absorption and the adsorption in absorption what happens is uh, the solute or the species of interest gets uniformly distributed inside the solvent or the liquid medium so that's called adsorption for example carbon dioxide uh, gets absorbed in uh, ethanolamine solution or sodium hydroxide solution. Whereas, in adsorption the solute gets attracted to the surface and it remains on the surface. So, it is a surface phenomena. So, rest of the bulk of the solid uh, does not have the solute present. So, that is the main difference between the absorption and adsorption. But uh, in some situations you may have combination of both absorption and adsorption and that is called sorption S O R P T I O N as you can see here sorption. So, there are two components present in the adsorption process. One is the solute of interest or the species and that is called the adsorbate. For example, if you look at this particular picture this is the adsorbate which is getting adsorbed on an adsorbent. So, the adsorbent is um, the activated carbon or zeolite or alumina or any solid material and the adsorbate um, is gas or a liquid small molecule or even large molecules like protein they get and get adsorbed on the surface. So, the remaining bulk will never have this particular adsorbent present and generally they form a monomolecular or bimolecular or multi layer um, of this uh, particular adsorbent on top of the adsorbate. So, if you look at the liquids for example, if you look at uh, the water molecules present in the liquid, water molecules are uniformly distributed inside the liquid, but if you take a water molecule right inside the bulk, it will be surrounded by many water molecules. So, the forces are acting in all direction. So, the net force will be 0. 
okay, the attraction uh, because of the hydrogen bondings. So, the net hydrogen bonding forces and um, the electrostatic forces will be 0. Whereas, if you take a water molecule which is almost near the interface between the liquid and the gas, it is getting attracted from all the sides where there are water molecules present. Whereas, uh, in this particular area you have only gas molecules, so there are no attractions. So, what we find here is unbalanced forces. So, the water molecules that are present near the surface of the liquid gas interface experience an unbalanced force. That is why you get something called the surface tension, okay. whereas the water molecules that are present right inside the bulk have many water molecules surrounded and the attraction forces cancel each out. So, adsorption in solids you also have residual forces that is coming because of unbalanced valency, unbalanced valency in various atoms present on the surface of the uh, solid material. This can happen due to cleavage of big crystals, when the big crystals get cleaved they form smaller uh, crystals and that lead to many vacancies. Uh, and that lead to many residual forces actually. And these residual forces get sort of balanced by the uh, particular um, adsorbate which is going and settling down on this adsorbent. It is a spontaneous process because if you look at thermodynamics of the adsorption process, you will see very interesting uh, um, uh, information. The delta G of this uh, entire adsorption process is generally negative and you all know this second law of thermodynamics delta G is equal to delta H minus T, T delta S and delta G is generally negative because it is a very spontaneous process. And during the adsorption process the molecules which are randomly present either in the liquid or in the gas once they get adsorbed uh, the randomness decreases the number of degrees of freedom also decreases. So, what happens? the delta S becomes negative here. So, what happens to the uh, equation delta G is equal to delta H plus T delta S. And because it is a spontaneous reaction and delta G being negative, you also need to have delta H much more negative than this particular positive term that is what we have put here. The, uh, the value numerical value for delta H must be much larger than the uh, T delta S and delta H has to be negative. So, that delta H G also becomes negative. So, adsorption always is an exothermic process. So, heat is generated when this adsorption takes place that means, when the um, adsorbate gets adsorbed on the adsorbent. So, there are two types of uh, adsorption one is the physical adsorption the other is the chemical adsorption. So, as I originally mentioned uh, the forces that are acting are things like van der Waals forces um, or there could be weak chemical bonds uh, which are strong forces of attraction and uh, so this leads to two types of uh, adsorption the physical as well as the chemical adsorption and both of them differ from one another the way they respond um, when you change temperature or when you change pressure or when you change any other operating conditions actually. So, physical adsorption it is also called physisorption generally happens under weak forces like when you have weak van der Waals forces of attraction then it is generally called the physisorption or physical adsorption. And uh, the enthalpy of this process the delta H is of the order of 20 to 40 kilo joule per mole. Physisorption energies are much lower than chemisorption energies. So, the energy um, enthalpy is around 20 to 40 kilo joule per mole. You will form a multi layer of adsorbate on the adsorbent that means, you will have one layer of uh, the adsorbent and uh, you can also have another layer of adsorbent on top of it and so on actually and generally happens at low temperature below the boiling point of the adsorbate. 
and as the temperature increases the process of physisorption also goes down. So, as you keep on raising the temperature and you, as you keep nearing its uh, boiling point the physis option keeps do going down and that is the time when the chemis option happens actually. So, chemis option is nothing but chemical adsorption. So, here the forces of attraction are chemical forces or chemical bond type of forces whereas, in physis option you have weak forces like uh, van der Waal forces. So, you generally form a unilayer of the adsorbate on the adsorbent and if you look at the uh, delta H that is the enthalpy of adsorption it is very high 200 to 400 kilo joule per mole whereas, in the previous case we talked about almost 20 to 40 and it can happen at all temperature that means, uh, much above its, uh, its uh, vaporization or the boiling point. With the increase in temperature chemisorption first increases and then it starts decreasing whereas, uh, in physis option with increasing temperature the process keeps going down all the time. For example, this is a typical adsorption isotherm it is called the adsorption isotherm that means, at constant temperature if I keep varying the pressure that is the pressure in the x axis and what you have is the amount of adsorbate that is adsorbed on say m amount of adsorbent. The graph will go up like this that means, uh, as you keep increasing pressure uh, the amount that is getting adsorbed on the adsorbent will keep increasing and after some time it will not increase further. Okay. So, you will not see much change here actually this is a basic adsorption isotherm, but there are situations where um, you might not uh, reach a plateau you may reach a plateau, but then again you may see uh, some more increase and so on when there is a multi layer uh, adsorption taking place after the formation of a monomolecular uh, or a uniform uh, single layer actually. So, but basically as you increase pressure uh, the amount that gets adsorbed keeps increasing and it will plateau after some time at a constant temperature. So, I can have this type of curves at different temperatures as well actually. Okay. So, I can have a series of uh, adsorption isotherm at varying temperature that describes the entire adsorption process. There are different types of uh, adsorption isotherms. We have terms like linear adsorption isotherm, Freudlich, Langmuir, the BET theory and so on. We will talk about each one of them slightly more in detail and uh, these types of uh, adsorption isotherms are used in calculating the amount of uh, adsorbent required in the entire process of adsorption um, and so on actually. So, we for designing a yeah, adsorption process the type of equilibrium relation between the adsorbent and the adsorbate is necessary. That means, you need to determine the relationship between the adsorption process that is the adsorbent and the adsorbate in your lab. So, that you can use that data for um, large scale design. So, let us look at uh, the basic uh, adsorption process. So, what happens the adsorbate interacts with the adsorbent and you form an adsorbed species this is called adsorption. The same thing can get desorbed and you can have the vacant uh, sites as well as the, um, the species in the gas and the or the liquid phase that means, it can come back to its original form. So, this is called a uh, adsorption equilibrium process. So, you can have adsorption, you can also have desorption taking place uh, in the entire process actually. So, if you look at uh, Lee Chatelier's uh, principle, what the principle say states is the direction of the equilibrium either forward or backward is governed based on the stresses and the direction will match. So, that the stress gets relieved that means, if the stress is very high in one direction, the stress is very low in the other place 
So, it will move from one place to another place. So, the stress gets relieved or released. So, if uh, put in excess pressure to the equilibrium system, the equilibrium system will shift so that the number of molecules decreases. For example, if I take uh, adsorbate and adsorbent, if you assume this as one molecule and another molecule and you end up with one particular species the adsorbed species. So, if I you are starting from two molecules ending up with one uh, complex species. So, there is a decrease in the number of molecules. So, when you apply pressure it should move in the forward direction that means from the left to right. So, with increasing pressure what happens we will move uh, from this left direction to the right direction. So, the e so the forward direction is favored in the equilibrium reaction. So, when you decrease the pressure, so what happens? The adsorbed species get desorbed. So, if I want to um, capture a gas, one particular gas from a mixture, so adsorption is a very good uh, downstream approach. So, I have a adsorbent and the particular gas or species gets adsorbed at high pressure and once my gas mixture is passed, you have the adsorbate getting adsorbed on the adsorbent and then I just reduce the pressure. What happens? The gas that got adsorbed gets uh, released. So, thereby I can collect the gas. For example, if I want to uh, remove yeah, very useful gas from a mixture of uh, several gas gases. I can use this type of principle. In fact, uh, the uh, pressure swing uh, adsorption where you are uh, generating nitrogen from air is based on this principle. So, air is passed at uh, high pressure and uh, the nitrogen gets preferentially adsorbed on some adsorbent and then afterwards the pressure is released the nitrogen gets desorbed. So, you collect the nitrogen. Then again you pass the um, air at high pressure, nitrogen specifically or preferentially gets adsorbed and again you release the pressure, nitrogen gets desorbed. So, that way you are able to um, separate nitrogen from air. In fact, it is a very, very cheap and very um, simple system and that is how nitrogen is produced in very large scale using air and uh, this is called a pressure swing adsorber. Otherwise, in olden days they used to have cryogenic systems where uh, air used to be cooled and uh, nitrogen gas used to be cooled and collected as a liquid and that is a very expensive system because you need very extensive cooling and uh, cooling costs are very, very high. Whereas, the pressure swing adsorber uh, all you need is a compressor um, where the air is compressed and sent into the system and then um, the afterwards you desorb by releasing the pressure. So, the um, uh, zeolites which is used for performing this operation can be regenerated many, many times and so the operating cost is just running the uh, compressor that is all nothing else. It is an extremely cheap way of uh, uh, getting nitrogen from a mixture of uh, a nitrogen oxygen that is air. So, this type of uh, adsorption systems uh, are found in industrial applications as well especially for separation of gases, purification of gases, separation of uh, uh, toxic gases uh, and so on actually. So, what happens after saturation when I keep on increasing the pressure the amount that is getting adsorbed does not change because, because why? Because the number of sites, active sites available for the adsorption are limited and hence once the active sites are saturated you do not get any more uh, solute attached to the solid. Of course, the main assumption here is it is a monomolecular adsorption that means uh, you are not going to have another molecule um, of the species 
on top of already existing monomolecular layer actually. So, at high pressure all the sites are occupied that is why at very high pressure um, the adsorption process is independent of uh, the pressure. So, at very high pressure uh, it is a 0 order reaction whereas, at low pressure it is almost like a first order reaction, but then uh, it varies let us have a look at many types of adsorption and the main assumption here is the number of vacancies or sites available for adsorption is limited. Okay, that means, you are not creating new sites during the process. So, all the sites get uh, filled up, so no new um, species or molecule can get attached or get adsorbed. Let us look at uh, one of the adsorption isotherms, it is called Freundlich adsorption isotherm. So, the equation is x by m is equal to k p raised to the power 1 by n or sometimes people use it as k p raised to the power n as well. You know. p is the pressure, k is some constant, x is the amount of solute adsorbed in m amount of adsorbent. So, this is a solute by adsorbent, but it does not work at high pressure, it generally this equation is very good at low pressure. So, the uh, the value of this exponent determines the relationship between the pressure and the rate of uh, amount of uh, solute that gets adsorbed. So, this equation is good for low pressure, but it is not good for high pressure conditions. Let us look at another adsorption isotherm and it is quite popular, it is called the Langmuir adsorption isotherm. So, what it says is uh, there is a dynamic equilibrium between the ab adsorbed gaseous species or molecules and the free species. Okay. So, if A is your gas in the gaseous phase and A is the gas that is adsorbed phase and B is your solid or the vacant site available. So, A plus B going to adsorbed species and there could be always a desorption taking place actually. So, the Langmuir adsorption says there is an equilibrium uh, between the A in the gaseous phase and the A in the adsorbed space and the B is a vacant site or site available for the adsorption. Okay. This could have uh, some unbalanced forces, this could have some ionic forces or electrostatic forces which makes the uh, gas uh, preferentially getting um, adsorbed. For example, if you want to have hydrogen adsorbed on nickel, you need to activate the nickel site, so that uh, it can uh, take up uh, hydrogen gas on top of it. So, when we um, solve this equation, the where the assumption is the amount of uh, gas present in the gaseous phase is in equilibrium with the gas in the adsorbed phase, you end up with a relationship like this. You have theta equal to k p divided by 1 plus k p, where theta is the number of sites of the surface which are covered with gaseous molecule, p is your pressure and k is the equilibrium constant. That is the equilibrium constant of distribution of adsorbate between the surface and the gas phase. So, it this k determines what is the partition or the equilibrium constant of the amount of gas in the adsorbed phase and the gas phase. So, you see that as uh, p increases um, the number of sites which are covered by the gaseous molecules increases, but uh, it is not all the time, because after some condition uh, this number becomes very large. So, it will not uh, ha have any effect at all, we will talk about that in the next slide. So, uh, you are not going to have all the time a linear relationship between the p and the theta, because you all also have a term 1 plus k p in the denominator and depending upon the ratio of k p and 1 plus k p, the effect of p um, on theta will vary. So, again the basic limitation in Langmuir model is that it uh, is valid only at low pressure 
and the Langmuir model also assumes a monomolecular layer. That means, it does not assume that uh, after you form a monomolecular that you can have a um, another layer of gas sitting on top of the original layer of the gas that got adsorbed. So, if you take that equation and if you see uh, at very low pressure k p is going to be very small. So, 1 plus k p will become 1. So, your Langmuir equation becomes theta is equal to k p that means what there is a first order relationship between p and theta. So, the amount of gas that is adsorbed will be directly proportional to the pressure. Whereas, when you have large k p that means, at very large pressure what happens 1 plus k p becomes almost k p. So, the numerator and the denominator gets cancelled the theta becomes 1 that means, theta is no more a function of pressure theta is, big, is now a 0 order um, with respect to pressure pressure has no effect on theta and the surface gets fully saturated with the adsorbed gas or adsorbed species. So, at low pressures theta is a first order with pressure that means, there is a pressure is directly proportional to theta whereas, at large pressure theta is independent of pressure and the theta will be fully covered with the, the adsorbed species. Another interesting thing is if k is very very large that means, the, um, the equilibrium constant between the, um, the gas in the gas phase and in the adsorbed space is very large once again theta will become 1 that means, the adsorption process is spontaneous and the surface gets fully covered with the um, uh, gas species. So, the Langmuir model can have two different conditions at low pressure pressure the pressure is directly proportional uh, to theta or theta is directly proportional to pressure or whereas, at very high pressure theta is independent of pressure. So, that is a 0 order reaction. So, at low pressure you have a first order reaction with respect to pressure and at um, high pressure you have a zero order reaction with respect to pressure. So, all these models work very well at low pressures all these models assume uh, just a monomolecular layer or a mono layer. So, in some situations when you have very very high pressures um, you have multiple layers of adsorption. So, how how do you address that? One of the ways of addressing which was performed using the BET adsorption isotherm. Uh, this was coined because uh, uh, this isotherm was uh, discovered by three um, scientists Brunner, Emmett and Teller that is how it was coined as BET. So, this assumes that there is a multi layer formation unlike the previous theories. And uh, this assumes that uh, once you form a single layer, you can form the next layer. So, when you go to high pressure, because um, if you look at uh, the these theories of uh, uh, Freud Lage or uh, the Langmuir, which is very ideal for low pressure, when you go for high pressure you have thermal energy of gaseous molecules decreasing and more and more of gaseous molecules will be available at the surface. So, you will end up with a multi layer adsorption process and uh, the equation becomes uh, slightly more complicated. So, we have V total that is the adsorbed volume of gas at high pressure condition equal to the volume of gas that is needed for a mono layer adsorption and then uh, you have many terms the p by p naught here coming into picture and so on. So, it becomes a much uh, complicated equation which takes care of uh, 
the multilayer adsorption based on the amount of gas that gets adsorbed in a single layer. Okay. Here you have a, a new constant called C. Now, C is a function of uh, two terms which is uh, K 1 divided by K L okay. and the K 1 is the equilibrium constant when single molecule adsorbed per vacuum site and K L is the equilibrium constant for the saturated vapor liquid equilibrium. Okay. So, we have uh, um, some constants coming here and these are the pressure terms uh, coming into picture actually. So, this particular equation gives an idea about the adsorbed volume of gas at high pressure with the, as a function of the adsorbed amount of gas when there is a unilayer or a monolayer coverage. Adsorption is a very useful um, technique which can be adopted in several areas both in chemical engineering operations as well as biochemical engineering operations. So, for example, charcoal it is used uh, um, for decolorizing liquids, it is used in uh, decolorizing liquids uh, because it can adsorb uh, the um, colorant present especially um, sugar solutions, sucrose solutions uh, and so on. Silica gel is used in desiccators, you would have all seen silica gel in many places um, it adsorbs moisture. So, if you want to make a, a, a environment free of moisture, silica gel is the most ideal type of uh, adsorbent. So, you also have silica and alumina gels um, for removing moisture, controlling humidity in rooms, um, in large uh, storage areas and storage bins. Act activated charcoal is used as a gas mask because activated charcoal has a wide range of uh, adsorption uh, capacity and preferences. So, it can uh, adsorb many toxic gases, vapors. So, it can be used as a purifier, air freshener. It is also used for some of the breathing apparatus. Adsorption processes are also used in heterogeneous catalysis. Suppose, if I am doing a um, hydrogenation of oil using a nickel catalyst, the hydrogen is the form of a gas, nickel is in the form of a solid and your oil is in the form of the liquid. So, what happens? Hydrogen gets adsorbed on nickel catalyst and then it reacts with your oil to hydrogenate the oil. So, there adsorption becomes a very important phenomena and uh, the rate at which uh, the hydrogen gets adsorbed in nickel plays a very crucial role in the overall rate of reaction. And if you can improve or enhance the adsorption um, capacity of nickel, then the process becomes very economical because you will be using less nickel. Same thing happens if you look at your uh, um, burning of uh, exhaust gases from cars especially NOx and sulphur dioxide and so on you are using a platinum rhenium catalyst. So, oxygen gets adsorbed on to platinum rhenium catalyst then um, the carbon monoxide or sulphur dioxide or uh, NOx that passes through the exhaust after the petrol gets burnt gets totally oxidized. So, here again the adsorption of oxygen on top of this uh, um, platinum rhenium catalyst plays a very, very important role in the entire process. So, adsorption is a key step in the heterogeneous catalyzed reactions and uh, that governs the rate of reaction, that governs the capacity of the reaction and so on actually. So, what are the factors that affect adsorption? Many factors that affect adsorption, um, things like temperature, pressure, surface area, presence of uh, competitive inhibitors and so on actually. Temperature is a very important phenomena. So, at low temperature uh, adsorption increases. So, when 
generally we keep the temperature low you are going to have a forward reaction, but at high temperature uh, according to the Lee Chatelier's principle at high temperatures it will not favor the forward reaction. So, you will end up having a desorption. So, low temperature you can have good adsorption whereas, at high temperature you will end up having a desorption. So, you have to be very careful in um, maintaining the temperature of reaction and because it is an exothermic process and you might have studied in your thermodynamics that any exothermic process it is ideal to keep operating the process at lower temperature pressure. We studied in detail just few slides back that pressure plays a very important role in the adsorption process and at uh, low pressures increase in pressure increases adsorption until the whole system reaches a saturation level and after that uh, the pressure has no effect on the adsorption process. So, that way pressure also plays a very important role and especially in the gas gas solid type of uh, process uh, pressure is extremely crucial. Whereas, in liquid uh, um, solid type of process pressure is not so crucial whereas, temperature will play a very crucial part. Next one is surface area because adsorption is a surface phenomena more the surface you have more interaction between the two phases. So, the adsorption process also becomes um, very effective. So, having a very large surface area is the key to any adsorption process that is why uh, you have carbon activated carbon um, sold in the market having several um, hundred meter square per gram as its surface area. So, creating high surface area carbon for adsorption is a big challenge and that is what industries do actually. So, surface area is a very important parameter and um, all the adsorption material that is used here are high surface area material. Next one is activation of the adsorbent. So, how do you activate it? You can break, break the solid crystals into small pieces. So, when you break it you will get a more smaller pieces and the forces of at attraction or repulsion gets um, unbalanced. So, the adsorption process also becomes uh, much more effective. For example, charcoal if you take if you heat it to a high temperature then uh, you will have a better activated uh, charcoal and um, it will be ideal for performing certain adsorption process. Sometimes uh, you can even do acid wash by doing acid wash you are removing impurities present in charcoal as well as you are activating the charcoal. So, it becomes more effective in performing certain adsorption processes because when you put in acids you are generating lot of H plus ions on top of the charcoal. So, you have preferentially um, certain cationic uh, material getting adsorbed. So, acid wash is a very useful technique to activate an adsorbent. Sometimes you heat uh, the material for example, if there are any tarry um, uh, deposit on charcoal or zeolite or even metal particles when you heat it to high temperature um, what happens the tar gets burnt. So, again the catalyst or the surface get regenerated or reactivated. So, using high temperature is one way of activating your adsorbent and that is what is followed in many processes. So, um, when you are doing a hydrogenation the nickel starts getting deactivated because of the deposition of uh, um, the oil and tarry material or waxy material. So, again it is deactivated at higher temperature same thing happens in some of the petrochemical products um, when you are passing uh, fuels you are going to have um, wax or high molecular weight hydrocarbon deposited on the catalyst surface um, and the activity of the catalyst surface goes down. So, there temperature is raised and the tar is completely burnt off. So, that the catalyst again gets regenerated. So, use of temperature is very good for activating your adsorbent assuming that temperature does not affect your adsorbent. For example, if you use very high temperature there could be sintering taking place. So, sintering is nothing but 
uh, agglomeration or conglomeration of uh, smaller uh, particles of the surface into larger particles. So, when you move from smaller to larger particles, the surface area goes down. So, the activity also goes down. So, if you use very high temperature for activating your adsorbent, sintering could be a problem which should be addressed as well actually. So, there are many adsorbents present in the market because adsorption is a very old technology, um, it is well developed. So, there are many products in the market like activated carbon, charcoal, zeolites, silica aluminate and so on. So, these are widely used for a large number of gases, um, for liquids, um, metabolites and so on. So, they are for example, the activated carbon they are found as spheres, pellets, rods, mouldings, monoliths and so on. Actually, so, you have different shapes and sizes um, and you can produce uh, these material in all those shapes and sizes. So, if you take activated carbon generally the size varies from 0.5 millimeter going right up to 10 millimeter. They should have a high abrasion resistance because as the fluid flows through this um, adsorbent there is going to be attrition it should not start disintegrating. Um, and once it starts disintegrating, it may block the pipe or the tube or it may totally get uh, removed from the reactor. It should have high thermal stability, it should have small pore diameters, it should have very high surface area which will lead to a high surface capacity. So, these are the properties of a good adsorbent material. So, when you are buying an adsorbent material or when you are designing an adsorbent material you have to keep these points in mind. All the adsorbent material have good pore structures, some of them have very uniform diameter pores and um, there is lot of research done in designing these pores of uniform diameter. You do not want a very large distribution of diameters that means, very small diameter pores to very large diameter pores. So, if you have very small diameter pores sometimes the gases might not enter. So, those pores become useless. So, maintaining the diameter to a very uniform number or value is a very important challenge when designing adsorbent. So, designing a, a uniform diameter pores is very very important if you want to have a manufacturing um, product. Most of these industrial adsorbents fall into three classes, one is called the oxygen containing compounds, carbon based compounds, polymer based compounds. So, if you we'll take oxygen containing compounds, so as the name implies there is an oxygen there that means, they are hydrophilic and polar the, like silica gel, zeolites. Okay, silica gel is nothing but some sort of a sodium silicate. So, they, so they are all hydrophilic. The carbon based is mostly hydrophobic or non-polar like activated carbon, graphite all these are hydrophobic material. So, they are favored for hydrophobic gases whereas, uh, if you if you have a hydrophilic uh, adsorbent they will prefer hydrophilic or polar gases. Okay. The third type is the polymer based material. So, polymer matrix. So, there is a polymer porous matrix. You may have polar or non polar functional groups um, attached to this polymeric porous matrix. For example, some of the ion exchange resins you will have uh, this type of uh, adsorption adsorbent present. So, three types of uh, adsorbent and depending upon whether you want to separate out a polar or a hydrophilic compound or you want to sub, a, um, preferentially take in a hydrophobic um, compound, you can select the type of adsorbent. If you look at silica gel, it is widely used because it is inert, it is non toxic, it is polar and it is very very stable. It, you can go right up to um, 400 degree centigrade. 
nothing but some sort of an amorphous form of uh, uh, silicate SiO2. So, how do you prepare it? You react sodium silicate and acetic acid. Okay. Once after the reaction is done, there are a lot of post treatment, so that you get the proper pore size distribution. As I said in adsorption, uh, the pores sizes as well as the distribution of the pores are the most important parameters. So, the preparation is one single step, but later on you do a lot of after treatment, treatments like aging, pickling etcetera, um, so that you good pore sizes and pore size distributions are obtained. So, silica gel where do you use? You use uh, um, for oxygen, natural gas, you can absorb a heavy polar hydrocarbons from natural gases you know. So, all these places silica gel is used, it is a very good uh, dehydrating agent. So, if you if you um, have packaging material, if you have uh, um, uh, rooms, storage area where you want to bring the humidity down, silica gel is mostly preferred. Zeolites, you have different types of zeolites, natural zeolites, synthetic zeolites, they are all crystalline alumino silicate. So, you have alumina and silica present with the repeating pore network. So, you have very defined pore sizes of silica present. For example, uh, if you take ZSM5, ZSM5, it is a 5 angstrom zeolite. That means, the internal pore diameter is 5 angstrom. So, similarly, you can have different sized zeolites. That means, when you have a pore of that particular dimension, it will be able to capture or take in gases of that particular size. So, how do you prepare it? You prepare it with the aluminum silicate and at high temperature the water gets released. So, it is polar. So, polar compounds nicely travel right inside the cage and you can do um, very preferential reactions of molecules using molecules of a certain dimensions based on the size of the internal pores. So, how do you manufacture this zeolite? It is a hydrothermal synthesis of sodium alumino silicate or uh, another silica source in an autoclave and then you do your ion exchange with certain cations like sodium. So, you get sodium ZSN5 that means sodium salt of ZSN5 or you can have a lithium salt or you can have a calcium salt or potassium or ammonium and so on. So, the dimensions can be between 2 to 9 or nowadays they even have large diameter zeolites. The advantage of uh, say for example, small diameter is it will preferentially um, capture only small diameter molecules whereas, the large diameter molecules go away. So, it is almost like a filter you, um, you just slow down molecules of that size which get entrapped inside the zeolite cage, whereas mole larger molecules which cannot enter the zeolite cage gets um, flushed out or washed. Um, so, you can separate out small molecules as against large molecules. So, once you have uh, prepared your zeolite um, um, using ion exchange, you go into drying and then it goes into pelletization and binding uh, to form macroporous uh, pellets. So, in a solid uh, material solid ad, uh, adsorbent always there is something called pelletization and binding. So, that the adsorbent uh, is mechanically stable and it has got a good shelf life as well actually. So, zeolite is another adsorbent which is widely used nowadays for gases as well as for uh, moisture removal. Uses drying of process air. CVOT removal from natural gas, carbon monoxide removal from reforming gases, air separations. I talked about uh, removing nitrogen from air in pressure sieving adsorption. Zeolites is the material that is used in pressure sieving adsorption. Catalytic cracking, catalytic synthesis that means preparation of uh, organic molecules from small molecules, reforming. So, it has got a wide application in petrochemical industries. You also have non-polar zeolites. So, what you have is uh, you use aluminum free silica sources 
by de elimination of aluminum containing zeolites. Then by treating the zeolite with steam at elevated temperature that is almost uh, greater than 500 degree centigrade. So, it breaks the aluminum and oxygen bonds which uh, makes the aluminum to be expelled from the zeolite framework. So, you can make uh, this type of non porous uh, material also. Then you have the activated carbon. So, it is highly porous amorphous solids microcrystals, graphite type of lattice. So, we can prepare in small pellets and it is very cheap activated carbon is the cheapest of all material, um, but only drawback is combustible that means in presence of oxygen it can burn. So, you have to be very very careful about it actually. So, we can manufacture from any carbonaceous material coal, bitumen, lignite, peat, wood, nut shells, coconut shells. So, practically from any solid carbonaceous material you can make activated carbon that is why it is extremely cheap to make and most of the uh, adsorption gaseous absor adsorption this particular um, adsorbent is used. So, here what do you do you have a carbonization process and then you have the activation process. So, in the carbonization what do you do you include drying and heating to separate the byproducts. The byproducts could be tar, other hydrocarbons from raw materials and other gases. So, all these are to be dried and removed completely which activates your material which activates your uh, carbon and hence it becomes an activated carbon. So, the here the carbonization process what you do is uh, you perform at 400 to 600 degree centigrade in an oxygen free atmosphere because you do not want oxygen. Once you have oxygen there is going to be oxidation taking place very high temperature very high temperature can lead to sintering and so on actually. Once you have done that then you expose it to oxidizing agent uh, steam or carbon dioxide high temperature. By doing that it will remove or burn the pores that are blocking uh, I mean it burns the agents that are blocking your pores thereby you are creating a three dimensional graphite like lattice. So, the size of these pores depend upon how long they spend during this particular process actually. So, larger exposure time will lead to large pores, smaller exposure time it will give you smaller pores. Okay. So, the most popular aqueous phase carbons are bituminous based because they are very hard, they have very good abrasion resistance, the good pore size distribution, low cost. Um, and then it can be used for a large number of applications like organic substances, non polar adsorbates, waste gas treatments as an adsorbent and so on actually. That is why it has got very good applications in several manufacturing processes. Okay. Okay.